The Planning Commission for the Village of Mount Pleasant for June 22nd, 2022. Roll call, please. Sorry, uh, Batia is excused. Meyer? Here. Driver? Here. Hewitt? Here. Rissler? Here. Ben Beckham? Here. Bosanowski? Here. Uh, moving to the approval of the uh, May 18th, 2022 meeting minutes. <coughs> Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the Planning Commission April 20, 2022 uh, minutes as presented. Second. I have a comment. Uh, there should be a correction in the memorial bench uh, application. It's got Davis as the mover of that. I was meet myself for removal and approve for the four applications. Gotcha. It's, it's minor, but nope. you, know, you, don't, you don't normally make any yep. motions. Right. <laughs> That's correct. All right. So noted. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Not move for a uh, 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 vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. No old business, move to new business. 2645 Fancher Road Certified Survey Map Application, CSM 0522. Who's got this one? Robin. Robin. Yeah. I just biked in from the, the bike race. <coughs> Did you win? Probably if I'd entered, but I have a motor on my bike, so like maybe they wouldn't allow me to to join. I'm a, I'm a filthy cheater. Um, so this is the Luan Drive Certified Survey Map Application, CSM 05-2022, um, parcel ID 15103-2204-018-121. The owner is Doris, <coughs> well, let me try this, Rachuski. Uh, that's close enough. Uh, the applicant is David and Donna Johnson. Um, comp plan is residential. Local planning area is four. Um, the zone is RE, and but it's proposed RL1. So it's currently um, the, the large parcel is RE. Um, the applicant proposed splitting the existing 4.123 acre parcel into two lots. One that will be a 20,000 square feet lot, which is a point poor four seven acres and the remainder of the property will comprise the other lot uh, the purpose is to transfer a piece of prop of the larger lot to an existing owner on on the street so the parcel immediately to the east is purchasing the lot both parcels um, the, of the split so that this one parcel is zoned re however the newly created lot requires a rezone to rl1 to be a legal lot um, as it's le currently less than an acre. So um, that is a part of the rezone that'll be up for consideration next, and that's condition three. Um, another option um, could have been to rezone the existing parcel uh, of the applicants to RE to allow a legally conforming uh, lot via a lot line adjustment for them to merge. Um, but staff recommended against that route um, because two separate developable parcels are in the long-term interests of the village. Um, two parcels with two houses is always better than uh, one bigger parcel with one house. Um, the village find staff funds the application complies with the land use element of the comp plan. Um, we lack an adopted plan for area four. Um, the, so as far as the chapter 74 standards, um, the applicant shall amend the stated zoning on the face of the CSM to reflect um, the applied uh, for <coughs> zone. And also the applicant shall resubmit the application to staff with a CSM land division format. Um, for some reason, this format was um, for the parcel merge option. Everything is still the same as far as the, the layout and information conveyed but it's just not officially labeled and a new parcel number designated. So um, we basically just said that they have to resubmit this with that information on it that has a new parcel number and it's gonna be a separate parcel rather than merged or conveyed to the existing parcel. We uh, discovered this a little bit late in the game um, and just gave them the option to uh, amend that and they should have that in 
um, sometime this week or, or, or by the time the village board approves it. Um, so for design standards, um, this, uh, this basically applies to rural land access streets. So uh, Luan Drive, uh, as denoted by the small street width and the large drainage swales, does not require sidewalks upon lot division. It would, however, require sidewalks when someone wishes to build a primary structure <clears throat> upon this empty lot. Um, so that's whenever they pull a building permit to put a structure on the property, that's when they would need a, a sidewalk for the property. So they're going to be the only property with a sidewalk? Yeah. So we'll get to that later. Right. I was going to say we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. um, but even, even then, like, that will be that's not the right now that's not the purpose of the 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 purchase they just want it as a side yard and we said that's fine as long as it's it maintains that it's a separate lot and whenever in the future uh required improvement um 74.8.15 street trees the ordinance does not require street trees because the application does not propose to dedicate any new roadways so uh, the application meets, it meets the RL1 lot size standards. Um, it does not lie with any tax increment districts. According to the village assessor, um, a new developable lot along Luan Drive would assess at about approximately $70,000, while the land value of the existing 4.1 acre lot would drop down from 129,000 to about 115. Um, so literally creating value out of nothing. Um, so the stats there um, are probably not, uh, they don't look very good because, you know, there's no house on it. But, you know, it is better than what it was. Uh, so village staff recommend approval and, and attach the following conditions. The applicant shall amend the stated zoning on the face of the CSM to RL1. They should resubmit the lot line adjustment documentation as a, an official CSM with a new parcel number. And the village clerk shall only um, certify the CSM if the village board approves the accompanying zoning map amendment ZMA 0522. So, and we recommend approval. Any questions? Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only question I have is, is it, they list the owner, but that's not the owner on GIS. So is this a new purchaser? Uh, so I, I actually know because of this parcel and this particular owner has protested the value <laughs> she's come here so i think there's some sort of trust or holding in pattern because she's the one si who signed um the documents and stuff like that so i, I don't know what that situation is well, well that's what i'm asking because on the there's two other people that actually own this property versus mm -hmm. her that's why i'm asking it's oh yeah so um i am not uh, aware of why that discrepancy exists I've noticed it too. It doesn't um, really matter, Joe. When they sign the application form, they attest <clears throat> that they have permission to apply on behalf of the existing property owners. If they don't, long story short, the village isn't liable well, for. I'm the talking about the owner. Correct. The, the owner is not the correct owner to the property. That's why. How does the the applicant? I can see how the applicant doesn't have to own it because they're doing it on behalf of the owner. But the owner is yeah. not what's listed in GIS. That's all I'm asking. Yeah. It's. Weird. I'm almost positive it's some other scenario in that she is the pro owner of the property, but it is has been recently transferred to somebody else's name because she moved somewhere else. Um, I think basically she downsized, got rid of it, and moved to um, other living facilities. So I, I, I believe that I can look into it. Um, also, <clears throat> I have spoken you know, to, there's a lawyer working on this on behalf mm -hmm of the property owner and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that they're being represented. Um, and of course they've signed all the documentation for it. I'll look into it and, and kind of give her a report back to the village board as far as to clear up that situation. Okay. I think it's a simple answer. I just don't know exactly what it is. When you say they signed everything, which they are we talking about? The applicant or the new owner? So the, the applicant is the new owner. The property owner is the, you know, e existing owner signed by, you know, Doris, um, who, I mean, I also have secondhand knowledge from a previous board of review session that she is a, the, a, the property owner of this, or at least was in name. Um, and then the lawyer doing the transaction and it's also been done through 
the, the surveys of Nielsen, Metz, and Barber. So I will get you the exact answer. I'm sure it is something very simple. Uh, this, this is a dead end road, and there's only a few houses on the whole on the whole road. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of houses on that road. There's been a lot of construction well, there's been down the building, but I'm saying built. is for a long time there was only one or two I, houses there. I get it, but I just don't. I when I look on the GIS because I'm very you know particular about these types of things and who's allowing what to happen, and then the, the own quote the owner, somebody's asking permission to do something with an owner that's not listed as the owner. I, that's the only I'm concerned with the legal part of it is to what are, so the way the process works is it doesn't really matter from the village's perspective because we could sign a CSM say it's the wrong owner like worst case scenario it's the wrong owner they still have to take it to the Racine County Register of Deeds to get it recorded and if the Register of Deeds is unhappy with the owner certificate on the final CSM whether it's like a paperwork mess up or they're really not the listed owner from the county's perspective um, they won't record the CSM. So the ultimate backup is it has to be recorded at the Register of Deeds. So, okay. wow. Well, <laughs> like, it, it honestly, like, that is the worst case scenario. So there is a final backup. You can approve it. Robin can figure out the ownership structure and report it to the village board. Um, but ultimately, we're not, we're just signing off that the village is okay with the land split. The county is, the Register of Deeds is the final place where this gets double checked. But we can't Visually. sign off unless it's being presented properly to us. I, I share the concern <clears throat> that I, um, if we're not sure. Could it be a, a personal rep or a trust? It could be. Yeah. We're saying we don't know, yeah. and we'll get the answer before the village board. I do know that listed on the tax, the tax history is that there was a death deed in 2017, which wouldn't have been Doris because I saw her after that. And then there's an affidavit on 20 in late 2018 um, of, of a transfer and the, the property. So um, I will investigate and get back to you as soon as possible. But for, for our purposes, we are basically reviewing the, the lot split itself um, and whether or not that is something that we're okay with. Yeah. Usually, usually it's been my experience, the registered deeds doesn't check the title who owns it or who doesn't. They just check to see if the document meets the requirements to record. So if it's signed in the right places and it's got a grantor or grantee, they will record it. Um, the, the land description office, once it's recorded, goes to a different office that actually checks it and says, oh no, this is not, this is not proper, but it's already been recorded. So I'm just trying, you know, that's what they do. But my question here is, um, are we, I don't know what's going on with lot one, but are we kind of getting to a lot, landlocked parcel eventually here? Because I mean, they've got a long, narrow piece, and there's no road on the north that I know. Oh, it, it fronts Fanshawe. <coughs> there's a house. I, I know, but the, the back piece there, you've got a long, narrow piece. Oh, uh, all that's undevelopable. It's within the, the sort of the area of the, I think that's the hoods there, um, within the waterway area so none of that is developable land um it that area kind of is right at the back of these properties um and then anything behind that you can't you could build on it if you wanted to okay because I, I was afraid i'd want to create a landlock parcel because then you mm -hmm. nowhere going back to this question of ownership I, I guess i'm a little less forgiving of the situation if the if doris the purported owner signed a deed in 2018. Here we are in 2022 with questions as to whether she's still the owner. And if they have an attorney, I don't know why there should be a question. I, I just, at the very least, I think we should add a fourth condition is that our approval is conditioned upon the applicant <coughs> and the owner providing written evidence to staff within a defined period of time Sure. Um, All of that is certifying, you know, establishing to your satisfaction that the who the owner is and the owner. Uh, All of that is a uh, boilerplate on the application, as Sam said, that they are properly represented um, and representing the interests of the property owner. Now that you guys have brought it up, I'll double check it this afternoon um, or tomorrow and get back and, and have that item before the village board on Monday for sure. Wouldn't this be resolved if uh the applicant and the owner sign 
uh, the just the applicant. Did so no, both of them question? have signed. They did a joint application. Oh. So, but it was Doris instead of the listed owners on the GIS. So I will I will find what that discrepancy is, and and report back. Um, I mean, maybe their power of attorney or something like that, or personal uh, rep. Yeah. Or they're they're they're, they're her children. Um, trustees. You know, mostly. trustees, something yep. like that. Um, she is an advanced in years, so all of those situations seem very plausible. So I will investigate and um, report back. And in the, in the meantime, we can make a recommendation on the matter. Um, and if it if this if I found out that there, that is there, I can't get the approval, or if I found out there is no approval from the property owner, we will we will table it and not have it for the village board. Is that good with everyone? That works for me. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Any other questions on this? Anything more you want to add, Robin? Uh, no. Uh, and just uh, just kind of backing up that you know the decision to, to kind of nudge them a little bit more towards R01 and as opposed to the other one, it also matches the the other size lots, like all the lots, and there are about a hundred feet. So we nudge them towards that instead of having one super huge lot. And they were good with this? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it, it will probably result in slightly more uh, tax payments on, <clears throat> on their part, but, you know, they know that. I've informed them of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there's no questions, do we have a motion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to recommend approval of the Loan Drive Certified Survey Map Application CSM 0522 to the Village Board, subject to the recommended conditions by and also uh, per uh, adding the fourth condition that staff will uh, confirm the ownership and making sure that that property is being transferred appropriately. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next will be ordinance. Uh, we just did that one. Or is, no. no, we do have to do an ordinance, correct? Yes, okay. this is the accompanying ordinance. So the ordinance for 19-2022 is zoning map amendment for land along Luan Drive, zoning map amendment application ZMA 0522. Yeah, Sam, you're right. That font looks very 70s. I think it's also with the, like, the, the the colored pencil kind of shading too. I think it turned out well though. Um, so as you see, this is the graphic representing the rezone application with one. Uh, All of the other inf background information is exactly the same. Um, <coughs> and this is a proposed rezone to RL1 in order for this lot to be a legal lot. Um, we also mentioned that the other option uh, as far as an RE, um, and this one was the the staff recommendation as well as what they decided <coughs> to go with. Um, the uh, the only condition is that they should only sign this ordinance as the village board also approves the corresponding survey certified survey map application, which is CSM zero five twenty two. Right, many questions. Well, then the same the <clears throat> same applies here. It's, it's Doris is listed as the owner requesting, so we would do that again. I would hope. Yeah, if this is linked to the the yep. approval of the CSM, so <clears throat> okay, that's the condition. So, you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make okay. a motion then to move to recommend approval of the ordinance 19-2022, a zoning map amendment for land along Luan Drive. Zoning map amendment application ZMA. 05-22 to the village board, subject to the recommended condition. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing another call a question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next will be Empson Hills Road Certified Survey Map Application CSM 0622. Sam. Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, the applicant proposed splitting the existing 0 .780 and 0 .970 acre parcel into six lots. Um, for the first tax parcel, they're just over 10,000 square feet. 
And uh, for the second tax parcel, the other four on the, uh, I believe that's the north side, are just under 10,500 square feet. Both, uh, so all about a quarter acre-ish. Um, both parcels are already zoned RL1. The application includes the dedication of Emston Hills Road. The applicant also proposed three lots and a roadway dedication directly to the uh, east, that should read. Yes. However, the city of Racine controls that land division approval. Um, in terms of compliance with the comprehensive plan and local planning area, the village staff finds the application complies with the land use element of the comp plan. It is a um, master plan for residential areas, including churches and multifamily. The village lacks an adopted plan for local area pl uh, planning area 18. In terms of the Chapter 74 subdivision standards, uh, for 74.6.2.7 existing and applicable proposed zoning, the applicant shall amend the stated zoning on the face of the CSM to RL1. Um, that's just a typo on their CSM. So first condition, uh, for 74.6.8 recording and filing, the applicant shall remove the planning commission and approval lines and the village president lines to include only the village clerks attest to the village board approval, which is condition number two. For uh, design standards, 74.723 collector streets, Emston Hills Road, as denoted by its large right of way, was originally planned to be a collector street between Meacham Road and Green Bay Road. However, the development pattern of the village now prohibits this connection without significant home and land acquisition, so it's not gonna happen. Um, consequently, the constructed road may be larger than required for local roadway traffic and encourage speeding between the city and village. The applicant shall therefore install traffic calming measures between the city and village to slow traffic such as curb bump outs, speed humps, or chicanes. Such features shall be subject to approval by the public works director. That's our third recommended condition. And finally, for temporary termination, if the applicant chooses to construct the village and city sections of the total development on different timelines, the applicant shall install a temporary circular or T-shaped turnaround within the street right of way. Um, we just thought that was in there. Their intent is to do all of this at once, but with two different municipalities, and you know, the city has a different process than we. We just wanted to make sure that we weren't holding them up on, on our end if they need to do a portion of it. In terms of 74.8 required improvement street trees, uh, the applicant shall revise the site plan document and subsequent engineering documents to plant street trees. For 74.8.15, the total number of trees to be planted shall be based on one tree for every 50 feet of frontage on all streets proposed to be dedicated and be spaced on average about 50 feet apart. The required tree shall be planted in the area between the sidewalk and curb in accordance with plans and specifications approved by the public works director. Street trees shall not be planted on steep slopes unless in walled plant beds and at bottom of swales. Trees could be installed outside of, but within five to 20 feet, depending on species canopy size of street rights of way, or steep slopes or other physical constraints exist. The requirement for street trees may be waived by the plan commission if substantial alternative landscaping, including trees, is to be provided within the land division in accordance with the landscaping appro plan approved by the plan commission. They did not submit one, so our assumption is that they will install street trees in the public right of way. However, there are um, both lots being significantly wooded, we did want to point out the option for them to utilize some of the existing trees out there for those requirements um, if they so choose. I don't know the health um, or species of the trees out there, so you know it depends on um, kind of local conditions as they move forward their construction plans. In terms of Chapter 90 standards, the application meets the RL1 lot size standards. From a fiscal note, the lands contained within the CSM do not lie within any tax increment districts. The 75th percentile home value for the village generates approximately $2,000 a year in taxes for the village. Additionally, a new single family home generates about $3,100 in impact fees. The RL1 zoning district allows detached homes, two unit homes, twin houses, and backyard cottages by right. Total estimated value of the development per acre is about 1.3 million to 2.45 million, which is greater than the village target of a million dollars an acre. Cost projections for adjacent road repaving estimate the project needs to contribute about 4.8 to 9.7 of its percent of its taxes over 20 years to the cost of repaving, which are greater less than the average the village on, uh, uh, contributes to its annual paving program, indicating the proposed lots will adequately pay their proportional long-term public in infrastructure fiscal obligations. In terms of the details, you have them in the packet for that uh, financial breakdown. In terms of conditions, we have the four previous, uh, or the five previous listed, um, and uh, 
with that, uh, we recommend uh, that the plan commission move to recommend approval of the CSM application subject to the staff recommended conditions. I just want to add, I'm really excited about this because as a planner looking at a map and seeing two roads that almost connect but don't has been like a hangnail for five years, um, <laughs> just, just saying. So this would do me a great favor if uh, this uh, happens and goes through. Thank you very much. Um, contact with adjacent residents over previous years you know people buying the neighborhood or whatever and you know you can almost see the streets from one end of the street to the other and wondering when it's going to connect through um, our, our typical response is when whenever a developer purchases it and <laughs> moves forward to do it um, someone has finally done so um, it's unsurprising via the the number of developable lots particularly easy developable lots has kind of been um, slowly dwindling as the 2008 <laughs> crash lots have finally been built upon over the last decade or so. So um, we finally got to a point where this makes sense from a market perspective. And um, But knowing that we're adding another connection into a neighborhood that doesn't currently have one, we, we specifically wanted to um, mention that traffic calming measure just to make sure mm -hmm. on a mm -hmm what was supposed to be a collector right of way that we're doing some stuff to slow down traffic in between the village and city just to make sure that people aren't using this as a new drag strip um, between them so between that uh, the only other thing I'll I have of note is uh, that we, I have discussed this with the public works director Tony Byer and he said basically this makes sense and that's was going to be something that happens sooner or later so he's aware and um, they'll review the construction plans per usual how does this work? Does uh, does it get done in unison with the city, or does it do they one, do it one at a time? Generally, yes. Although I believe our application procedures are a little bit quicker than the city's. They have a, a couple more committees that um, this has to go through, as well as the the mayor's signature for approval. Um, so generally, yes, in concert um, with the city uh, from a stormwater perspective, in terms of the you know adjacent road and things like that, they'll have to. It really makes sense to design as a cumulative project, um, particularly because two of the lots on the Mount Pleasant north side face what would be city right of way on the south side. So um, functionally, the entire thing kind of has to work in concert together, but um, the approval processes are separate. And we don't need to <laughs> base our approval on the, the city's approval. Um, they could move forward with just the Mount Pleasant side of the project if they so chose. I was, I was just wondering because of the you know, if, if it's done at the same time, it'll get done a lot faster than, than prolong it in an extended period of time. Yeah, my assumption will be they'll get approval from us, um, and then the city will <coughs> lag a little bit. And hopefully, they'll get approval from the city, record both CSMs at the same time, and then coordinate between both public works departments to uh, um, coordinate the construction, you know, which standard they're going to use for the street repaving and things like that. Um, so, in, in effect, it'll probably just be who's ever stricter. At that time, I got a thing that of something that I mentioned that didn't show up on here is that there should be a, a condition for lots three and four that in order for those to record, there has to be dedicated right away within the city of Racine. So those are dependent on the city of Racine's CSM going through. I would think also lot two. Uh, lot two can be so what the where the driveway is pulling from would be on Mount Pleasant side. But then you'd have to have a T there or something, right? I mean, they would still in the have guy's have front a, yard. <laughs> yeah, they would have it. So That'd basically, those lots wouldn't be buildable or can't get a building. Permit. Yeah, can't get a building permit unless you know that there's dedicated right away for them to go through. Okay. Um, you could still do a T and then pull that that driveway off there for lot two, um, and and if something really crazy word of thing and Racine would not be able to approve it at all um, you could do some sort of condo plat situation where you would join these three together and have some kind of back entrance or whatever but the basic thing is lots three and four are pretty much dependent on uh, the city of Racine approving that mm -hmm. dedicated right away yeah. okay. Sam <clears throat> I've got a question about the um can you just verify or explain to me who tracks and enforces this condition that a speed bump or a traffic calming feature be actually installed? Because this commission and you know we're not going to be on the scene when it comes time to pour the concrete. 
We do. So you're, okay, your office takes care of it. Correct, in coordination with the Public Works Department. Ultimately, if that's a condition for approval, approved by the Village Board, all of the staff is collectively um, required to uh, follow that direction. So <laughs> not just us individually, but Public Works, you know, building inspection, things like that. So. On this concern about unless we do something, the speed will be excessive. Is that a function of the fact that the, this proposed new road is going to be wide enough that it's going to invite speeding? Correct. Is it, then who is requiring the road be that wide if it doesn't need to be a collector road anymore? Uh, in our preliminary conversations, the city would like to see it that wide. Okay, so. It is pretty wide if you look at the, the right of way on the city got. side, yeah. It matches what they've already got. Yeah, so they'll they'll match it in, and then we'll try to neck it down or, or do something, um, speed humps, whatever, um, to uh, at least have people check their speed as they're coming across the municipal boundary. I've not seen myself, I mean, in terms of my time on the board, I haven't seen this sort of a thing where the Planning Commission and staff is requiring speed bumps on a road to calm the traffic. Is this something that comes up regularly or often or is this a really a unique unique situation i think as we've developed and a lot of what used to be kind of isolated neighborhoods have started to interconnect we've received more complaints um we've also received complaints with all the work that's been done on 11 over the past few years and 20. a lot of those adjacent neighborhoods kind of took the brunt of some of those um, alternate route pathways and so we received a lot of complaints about people speeding through those and then just finally for better or for worse this is not a problem that's affecting purely mount pleasant uh, a lot of different communities you know large like milwaukee and small rural communities are dealing with people speeding um, a lot of that is <laughs> a long-standing practice of building roads for maximum traffic capacity instead of you know the speed that people want <laughs> we want people to drive on and some of it is user you know error as well so it's kind of a big complicated soup of this is happening to everyone and this is just the start of us trying to be a little bit more proactive and um, working with the design of these roadways to to try to mitigate those concerns on the front end. Um, I think a good example is the Tivoli Green public streets that run through that development. Um, both encourage street parking due to the proximity of how close the street um, is to some of the front doors of those apartment units, as well as the small like roundabout in the middle of one of the roads and um, the narrower cross sections. Um, some of the other things that communities have done is, you know, um, more aggressive use of curb bump outs and things like that. It does require coordination with public works because obviously things like snow plowing and stuff, we need to assign them appropriately so plows aren't driving over <laughs> curbs and things like that. But in the long run, for a, a very long answer to your question, um, it's something that we are trying to be a little bit more proactive about in our subdivision design as we see more of these housing developments come in Mount Pleasant. But I'm puzzled, the fact that it's getting built out, this area, why does that diminish this street being a feeder street, a collector street? I mean, I would almost think the development would emphasize the need to have a feeder street. A master street. craft development is in the way to have it function as it was designed. Yeah, there's uh, some coal de sac to the west um, on the village side that prohibit it from going straight through as I think some of the original probably intent was whenever the first Emston Hills Road houses were platted. So, you know, barring us buying the ends of some, <laughs> some coals de sac, it's a tough word to say in plural, um, and uh, reconnecting some of those streets, which one would assume would be both unpopular <coughs> due to those existing homeowners and their adjacent neighbors, I think this is kind of where we're at. So the, the connection between Meacham and 31 will be complete when this is completed, but it won't be the straight line racetrack that was intended originally, because yeah. it it already you can go from Wood Road all the way over to uh, 31 through that subdivision, and it's it's a disjointed route, and you don't get up to speed like you would with a, 90 foot wide Empston Hills. Yeah, so 
you know, it's just one of those ones that kind of these small infill lots that we're starting to see a little bit more of. You guys have seen a couple of preliminary plats from um, Newport in the past year or two as well. Um, so people are starting to, to make these things work and they're, they're starting to pen out. Um, but you know, there are certain considerations when you're dealing with existing neighbors as opposed to brand new greenfield development. Yeah. So. Speaking of existing neighbors, we also kind of w was thinking that would be sort of a forward, like a preemptive, you know, addressing some of their concerns and problems. Um, we, you know, have had some like, years past, we've had random contacts from neighbors wondering what we're going to do with the property, yada, 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 usually kind of opposed to anything. Um, but we, we took those into account and kind of made it like the best possible uh, scenario so that it would be a slow connection and not a super fast one. Yeah, ultimately, we don't have a lot of either zoning or subdivision rules that would allow us to deny an application like this that met all the other ordinances. So it's an effort in how can we make this the best possible um, version of this development moving forward. Just a, just a thought in regards to that, though. If the city requires the 90 foot in front of their three, their three lots, if you will, then we're only talking about a bump out or chicanes for the distance of about 400 feet before it come to the T. Is that really going to be much of a, I would hope that they're slowing down by that time coming to a stop sign. But again, if, it, if, we're, if the city's going to require the 90 feet, then I'm not sure we're going to do much good from there to uh, Wood Road. Yeah, one would hope, one of the other, um one would hope that they are slowing down. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I totally agree with you, but we kind of wanted to plan for, for worst case scenario um, because th those were the major concerns we heard from the adjacent neighbors, um, as well as these will require sidewalks, kind of curb and gutter, um, so it's going to be a fully kind of upgraded roadway pattern, um, which makes it a little bit easier to add some of those bump outs and stuff as opposed to if it was like a rural cross section where you just drive through the gravel anyways so um, the road right of or the road profile itself lends um, to using a little bit more advanced traffic calming in here I think it'll be because we're only affecting six to eight lots and we're doing it on the front end it, it's a good a uh, kind of trial area um, for some of these uh, efforts as well um, that you know the neighbors would be happy with uh, we think and uh, the new home buyers will buy into it so you know, it's not like we're going in and messing with someone's existing curb rights of way or things like that. It would also serve almost as a border demarcation. You know, it's like got, got some nice street trees and a nice, you know, uh, bump outs and stuff like that. It says, welcome to Mount Pleasant. <laughs> You're in a more pleasant place. I'm assuming that Racine's going to require sidewalks on those three lots. I would assume, um, but... <laughs> Yeah. I, I can't say for certain. Well, again, and we're going back to, we're going to talk about that later, and this might be a situation where you, you look at that and go, hmm, maybe not. Yeah, well, uh, it depends. If this is a fully urban cross-section, the, the ordinance that we're proposing later might not apply to it, but um, I think your point is well taken in that way. It's kind of an odd scenario, so we yes. want to stay flexible. We'll continue to work with uh, Public Works on uh, the final street design and what options they provide. Um, we just wanted to identify it ultimately on the front end to make sure that the developer caught it instead of us asking for it after they've already engineered a roadway and submitted you know, final profiles and things like that. And then just one last thing regards to the owner and applicant. Mike Peterson and an applicant is Michael Peterson. Yeah, I could not is figure it? that out either. I, I, <laughs> I did catch that one. And one is the listed owner on the GIS and one it was on the application and they were listed differently. So I don't know if whoever wrote the application put in O-N and that's an error or if it was an error when recording it at the Register of Deeds. But okay. I just put uh, which the applicant name comes from the application they submit to us and the owner name comes from the uh, listed owner on the GIS. So. True Ellis Island situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe it's like twins and they have like similar last names <laughs> or something. But, uh, one's we'll, we'll one's Danish and one's Swedish. Yeah, <laughs> when we send the uh, approval letter, if it is so approved, or the denial letter, I guess, um, 
then uh, <laughs> we can ask them which one is the right one. All right, any other comments? Otherwise, a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to recommend approval of the Emston Hills Road Certified Survey Map Application CSM 06-22 to the Village Board, subject to the recommended conditions. Second. second. Um, motion and a second. Would you guys mind adding the condition Robin mentioned regarding lots three and four, um, and those lots specifically are conditioned on approval from the City of Racine, uh, dedicating the right of way? I so move that, that's fine. Great. Second. Sure, second's good with it as well. All right, so we have motion and a second. No further comments, then all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, so we're going to run through a couple code things here. Robin, I'll just stand up here and you can chime in as we go through okay. these. Um, so the first one, uh, this is kind of our three-month-ish code update, code of ordinances, you know, um, between each uh, uh, quarter, more or less, we make a list of stuff that seems silly um, or that requires update or that people have complained about, et cetera, et cetera. A journey through Robin's brain. <laughs> a journey through Robin's brain, stuff that we might have just read and realized was in error um, to bring to you guys for code updates. So here are the three that we have for you for essentially the summer months. Um, the first is the height limit for single family uh, detached and two unit houses um, in RM and RH districts. Currently, they are uh, limited in height to 35 feet. Uh, we thought that was a little bit silly considering those same districts allow multifamily buildings up to 40 feet in the RM districts and in the RH districts, theoretically, you could build a multifamily building up to 90 feet. So giving someone a, uh, an extra five feet of house um, in effect allows us to encourage a third story on some of these homes. So if that's a two unit house, maybe you have a more spacious, you know, stacked flat duplex or for a single family home because these are narrower lots. Um, oftentimes what you see is kind of a third story master suite or, you know, some sort of mixture of master suite and outdoor like roof deck thing. Um, so just wanted to allow for those on those more um, narrow lots in the RM and RH districts. Yeah, we just really kind of wanted to key on the one particular home style that seemed to kind of strike us here is basically the skinny attached townhome. Um, basically with one garage door um, and, you know, sort of built vertically, you could easily get to, to three stories on those. And those are pretty, uh, I guess, cost efficient and bang for the buck um, for developers to do. And they're also very attractive and, and also a lot of times go into home ownership models. So it's kind of a really, it's something that we want to encourage. Can you clarify something for me, sure. Sam? You said that in an RH district, you're allowed to go how tall? <laughs> a RH2 multifamily building could go up to 90 feet. Okay, so this isn't RH2, this is just RH. Correct, so RM and RH only pertaining to detached and two-family homes. Okay, thank you. What question we did want to pose before we move on uh, to the plan commission is if this line of reasoning makes sense um, to you all, some of our zoning districts do still have other areas where the heights are not necessarily kind of um, complementary across different building types. So Robin mentioned townhomes. We also allow things like cottage courts, um, you know, detached buildings, smaller like six plexes. Um, so one of the th thoughts that we had, and we thought this was a good avenue to have the discussion, is um, trying to better unify the heights across the districts. Um, so essentially RL districts, perhaps you're at a 35 foot height limit. RM districts, perhaps you're up to 40-ish height limit, really allowing that third story. And RH districts, and this would be the big change, is allowing even greater heights for some of these buildings. Um, what that would, in effect, require is us breaking out some of these tables to be a little bit more complicated. Um, so we didn't want to throw all of that at you at once without kind of having the discussion. But we think in the long run, um, it kind of makes sense to uh, allow some more unified height limits across districts and building types. But if you want to kind of road test it for a while, too, we wanted your feedback. 
So thoughts? I mean, we, we can undergo a bigger project, or if you just want us to approve this for now, we can um, you know, put a pin in that and maybe come back in the fall with some better stuff. It's, it's up to you guys. I think while it's on your mind, go for it. Yeah. Well, and again, if, especially if somebody, if, if there's a proposal coming from a developer that has some thoughts on that, it would be nice to kind of get what that would look like, too, from our perspective. A visual as always helps when you're going, okay, what are we talking about here? Sure. 60 to 8, 90 feet, that's getting up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in effect, you know, becomes eight or we really cap the general height limit for the village with exceptions for certain types of buildings and structures at about eight stories seven to eight stories depending on the roof pitch we also measure height to the peak um, not to you know mid-span or you know the eve so communities measure it differently we measure to the peak so our our measurements are true height um, which has certain pros and cons but it's the cleanest when you read it, you know. Well, sometimes we have tall. to limit the height to um, basing it on it. The fire protection, you know, the ability to get up to a certain limit. And I think we've had that, like on the hotels and stuff, roughly 100 feet. Max. Yeah, I mean, generally, ultimately, these buildings are sprinklered and have other um, safety requirements above certain height limits as well. So once you start to push that, I mean, ultimately, you know, there are certain times where if we got really tall, you know, the fire department would obviously have to look at certain types of fire apparatus. Um, but there is going to be an upper limit to, you know, at some point you just can't get a ladder that high anymore. So <laughs> I don't think we're anywhere even close to those considerations. So, um, you know, the only really cities in Wisconsin that would need to worry about that would be Madison, Milwaukee. So and yeah. it's probably just Milwaukee because Madison also caps height limit around the capital too so i think in the long run our height limits are at a good spot and we would have to maybe in three zoning codes from now that'll be a discussion that they have to worry about i think the only thing that we've really been kind of spitballing just to kind of put some numbers on it is probably you know keep it either have rm go both of the rms go up to 40 or have rm1 still at 35 and then rm2 at 40 and then have the rh go up to like 45 so that would have allowed, allow like a three-story with some kind of pitched roof um and that's pretty much it because you don't you the, the only time you see single family that is or two family that is taller than that is really rare instances when you get the, the pencils in like philadelphia and stuff so we're not gonna get there so do you, do you um, look do you look at the area aesthetically and in the, in the surrounding area i mean I, I'm just like a guy in Kenosha just put in 40, 40 foot, two families, and everything around him is single family, one story, and it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. And do you take that in consideration when you make We don't decisions? really, not, we don't really have design area considerations. <clears throat> we try to keep that um, cleanly within the different zoning code classifications. Um, so in effect in Mount Pleasant, the way that would work is if someone were looking to rezone a property to um, a property with higher height limits, like a 40 foot in an RM district, for instance, um, then your consideration, both at a staff level and yours as a plan commission, your consideration would come at that time of zoning change. Okay. So some communities have like really, really loosey goosey guidelines and then leave it up to an aesthetic decision. We think ultimately in the long run, it's probably cleaner if you're making zoning decisions based on that instead of just saying, because then you get buildings that have artificial height limits based on who their neighbors are. And, you know, if, you know, you're living in a, a small community, you know, two square miles or something, that might make sense because the building types are pretty unified. But ultimately, we have like 34 square miles to work with. So we end up having to play with a little bit more black and white rules that even <laughs> treat everyone a little bit more equally across the village just because we're so big. And to put a perspective, um, the 35 to 45, which is the most we're talking about for single family, that's 10 feet. Um, when you build a ranch style home, uh, you might be at 16 to 18 feet. And in all districts right now, you can build up to 35. So that difference in our most basic difference, basic district would be almost double that of 
the dis difference within the RL1 district. Uh, frankly, just small ranch style homes are probably going to be dwarfed by any multi story building. And we do want to encourage, you know, second stories as much as possible because it's just a more efficient use of the land. Um, I, th I think one of the other things that would um, help to stop those contradictions from happening is in the RM and RH district, the lot sizes are capped at 7,200 square feet. So functionally you end up with a little bit kind of skinnier lot. So doing the standard type of ranch that might fit on a quarter, third of an acre, unless you're going like really like 1950s post-war, like 800 square foot ranch, uh, it's just not gonna fit on a lot. So we, some of the lot size requirements already push back upon those inconsistencies next to each other a little bit. So with that said, in summary, we'll move forward with this height limit change and then look towards um, some of the other uh, building types to make sure they're a little bit more unified. And then we'll come back in a month or two with kind of a broader, discussion on height limits for building types across zoning districts um, with a little bit more unified height limits there. Uh, second, um, this is uh, for sidewalks and pedestrian circulation, um, <laughs> our, our favorite topic. So the new zoning code does require sidewalks along every lot that abuts a public street. Um, one of the things that we like to do is take our zoning variances and use them as a double check to see, do our rules actually make sense? If people are applying for a lot of variances or we're having a lot of discussion at the plan commission regarding, do these rules even make sense here? That's a good trigger for us to say, well, maybe we need to add a little bit of nuance in areas. So Robin had the idea in areas where we agree that it doesn't make sense for a sidewalk, um, could we have, instead of either forcing someone to put it in or applying for a variance, giving them a third option to pay an in lieu of fee that would go into a segregated fund only for sidewalks where the village would then utilize that to build sidewalks in other areas of the village where perhaps we're making more logical connections between areas that are missing sidewalks or extensions of the existing sidewalk network into, for instance, commercial areas that don't have it but might benefit from pedestrian access. So um, we think the in lieu of fee makes a lot of sense. It was one of those things where Robin said it and I was just like, oh, like that makes a lot of sense right off the bat. We do that with parks um, in terms of new subdivisions, so why couldn't we do it with sidewalks? The other thing that happened is we have two developments that are, are approved already that we required sidewalks on at the very end of Louis Sorensen Road. One is um, truck parking for Rybar, the, ex the final expansion to the lot. And the other one was the Endeavor development um, sidewalks that were, uh, that's an industrial warehousing building on the south side of Louis Sorensen Road and the frontage road. Obviously, the corner of Louis Sorensen and the frontage road is about as far away from sidewalks as an individual point in the village could get. I mean, you had to go all the way to the multi-youths paths on International Drive or all the way north along the frontage road to Globe Drive where there are some sidewalks. So it's probably a half mile in each direction away. Um, they both applied for variances. That'll be up next month. Um, to uh, a leave sidewalk. So while this ordinance wouldn't take effect before the, the Zoning Board of Appeals rules on those variances, it's a good example of like both of these developers thought like, why are we doing this? It's a real cross section. And we thought to ourselves, why are we doing this? <laughs> so, you know, if each one of those stretches of sidewalk is, you know, 30 to $50,000 in just in lieu of fees, that would build out sidewalks south towards corporate drive or in other areas of the village where we have newer urban uh, um, subdivisions that we could you know then pick up those new sidewalks and take them into existing neighborhoods so some of the qualifiers that we wanted to note on here would be a the construction of a sidewalk or multi-use pathway is impractical or infeasible b the lot does not currently lie adjacent to any existing sidewalk or multi-use pathway. C, the village does not plan to construct adjacent sidewalks or multi-use pathways in the village's five-year capital improvement plan. So we didn't want to let someone off the hook if sidewalks will be there in a year or two. And then finally, D, the adjacent roadway uses a rural cross-section. And we thought that was an important qualifier because if there's an urban cross-section there, the plan commission's kind of direction to staff has been 
if it's a new subdivision or not, like those sidewalks should go in because that starts a network node somewhere in a residential area. And theoretically putting in a sidewalk on an urban cross section is a lot easier because you don't have to deal with the stormwater issues. When you're requiring sidewalk in a rural cross section, you either have to fill in the ditch, add storm sewer and curb and gutter and all of that, or you have to bring dedicate additional right of way outside of the ditch and then have a sidewalk on the other side of the ditch, which could either mean a steeper storm ditch or a wider right of way that we have to maintain in the long run. So we thought that didn't make sense just on these rural roads to to force the conversion on a parcel by parcel basis just for the for sidewalks. Um, the finally, as, though, as a former resident of the Sorensen Road, it makes sense what you just said. <laughs> yeah, those ditches are, they function, they're good stormwater facilities, and oftentimes we've re-ditched them um, as a part of a village project. To go in and fill them on a parcel by parcel basis doesn't make a lot of sense. And then finally, um, the only way that we could even get to the in lieu of fee option would be if all of those four things are true, plus myself, uh, Tony as public works director and the applicant all agree um, that this makes sense. So there are some double checks on me <laughs> um, mm -hmm. from engineering and the applicant. There are some double checks on Tony from me and uh, the applicant. And then there's obviously some double checks on staff in terms of the applicant. So we think it's a nice kind of triangle of if everyone can totally agree and they meet all these conditions. Um, you can pay an in lieu of yeah. fee. Yeah, it's an agreement, not forcing it. We're not. We're saying, okay, we're going to force you to give us money instead of building the sidewalk. It's it's an agreement between all the parties. Um, and honestly, a lot if they don't have to do the engineering or if there's difficulty in the terrain or something like that preventing the sidewalk from being constructed, um, paying at the rate, the village five year rate is probably going to be much cheaper than constructing their sidewalk anyway. Just as a, what would we have done uh, if for Christina Estates North? What, how would that work in? Because I know obviously they were not in favor of putting sidewalks in in the first place. It seemed kind of disjointed because the rest of the subdivision doesn't have it. So what are your thoughts there as far as where would that take us today? If, if they came in and said, hey, we really like this idea, would, how would that work? So explain to me, because you're talking about rural crossings and things like that, how would that fit in? So they, in their new subdivision, have an urban cross section. We don't really put in new roads unless they're a full urban cross section. So basically any new development that's putting in new roadways will have to put in sidewalks um, because we're not gonna approve a rural road section. Um, so this is really more for infill lots or undeveloped lots adjacent to existing village roads. Um, but if you're already designing an entire new street and neighborhood and have to take in new stormwater regs and things like that, um, they're going to be building an urban road and uh, they would be required sidewalks. So Christina Estates North would still have had to put in sidewalks. Okay. What you. this would allow us to do, though, is take the money from like Louis Sorensen Road and extend sidewalks. You know, if the argument is the neighbors don't currently have them, mm. well, now we'd have some money to add sidewalks in that neighborhood. And one of the things that we could do is put in sidewalks without specially assessing the adjacent property owners because essentially this development is paying for that expansion of facilities. So it's always easier to put in sidewalks. I know people don't like shoveling, but other than that, they really don't like being specially assessed. So if we have a different pool of funds that we can pull from and not specially assess someone, their arguments for not having sidewalks at least are diminished if they don't go away entirely. Yeah, any kind of, uh, most of the subdivisions, I, I would say almost every subdivision or residential area to the east of where we are now would probably not apply to this. Um, the existing subdivisions. Also, the, the rural corner uh, west of 31 that you know is undeveloped right now, that's also kind of you know somewhere where this could apply. But all the existing developed subdivisions, the density is just there that a sidewalk could always be kind of useful. Um, I think one final thing is in a lot of those areas, 
um, with the older rural roadway cross sections. A lot of those subdivisions were developed before the intergovernmental um, water agreement went into place. That says all new subdivisions have to be served with municipal water. So if they're an existing subdivision that's currently not served by water, chances are either now or <laughs> at the next pay time their paving project goes in, we typically at least ask those subdivisions if they'd like extension to municipal water service if it is um, possible in those areas. So at that time, if you're fully taking up the road and relaying water pipes and stuff, you know, it makes more sense for us to look at fully reconstructing those rights of way at that time as opposed to just like normal repaving projects or things like that. So, Sam, I've got some, I agree with your goal, but I have some questions about the actual verbiage and drafting. All right. The section, this provision seems to be deal with sidewalks or multi-use pathways. Yep. But once at, at the end of your first sentence in red, it doesn't say payment in lieu of sidewalks or multi-use pathways. It seems to use a slightly different term, quote, pedestrian path. So are we accept, does pedestrian path as a defined term include sidewalks or multi-use pathways? Yeah, it was just us trying to get a somewhat condensed name for the in lieu of fee. Okay, so somewhere in the general provisions, pedestrian path is defined to include those two things, sidewalks well, and multi-use Well, it's path. in lieu of pedestrian path, a payment in lieu of pedestrian path is all a proper noun. So that is like, what we are defining is um, the in lieu of fee later on in the section. But if you'd like us to rename it, we can do that too. I, I, just if you're going to use a defined term, pedestrian path, I just want to make sure it's I don't think it's existing with, defined as that. Well, then my inclination would be in lieu of sidewalks or multi-youth pathways. Otherwise, there's a little bit of confusion, at least to me. Um, then I would also s suggest that you talk to the applicant. These parties must agree to the following conditions. I mean, per personally, I would just have rewritten and must agree that all the following conditions apply is the way I would have said it. Um, and then the village, it's in the village's sole discretion whether to, to accept the payment, correct? Mm -hmm. So even if the four conditions apply, the village could still say, no, we want a sidewalk, correct. right? Uh, again, I would, just out of caution, say the village in its old, sole discretion may decide to do this. Then continuing into this, the fund um, so shall place, uh, is there such a fund logistically? Do you want to commit yourself to having a fund? Because are you going to set up a fund, a a checking account? Some so fund is used in uh, municipal finance terms of as like a separate budget fund. <laughs> it's like a separate budget area. All the village's a money. Whole different it, line. Yeah, it's in. It's all the village's money is in an account, um, but. Um, from an accounting perspective, they create like a new numbered fund. So for instance, TID1 is 420. Um, and uh, they, all of the TID funds remain within that and roll over year to year. So it's not a separate checking account as much as it is during budget time when the village board sees it. The money in that area rolls over year to year. I'm just gonna suggest you understand that. Some members of the commission understand that, but Joe Blow is, or a developer, may think you're talking about a segregated checking account somewhere. Yeah. I, you may want to just clarify that because I don't want somebody calling you, you know, two years later saying, hey, that $10,000 you took in the sidewalk, it yeah. was a segregated fund. We're not doing this as a, like an official impact fee because it's really an optional thing, um, but we will double check it with the parks language to make sure it is as close to our existing impact fee language as possible, just to clarify that. And yeah. again, I would just add, for, just to be safe, that, you know, this fund that you talk about for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, you mean anywhere in the village. Correct. You don't mean in that development. So no. again, if you want to just be a little more explicit, down in um, subparagraph B, the lot does not currently lie adjacent to any existing sidewalk or multi-use pathway. I just envision on some corner lots or some bigger parcels, the new development may be at the west end and over on the east end there's sidewalks. And now because there's a sidewalk on the east end of this, we're going to require 
the, this discretion would not be available on the west end because the, the lot is adjacent to a sidewalk here, but not at this end, which is where everyone's actually concerned about. Yeah. You would be able to use the variance process to basically strike that because of an exceptional circumstance, and then the, that that agreement would be able to be enacted upon. Um, that's I kind of thought that too. Like, there's got to be some really like you know weird thing where it's like some wicked hill or something like that. Um, but that's literally what the variance process is designed to do: is to get. Uh, properties out of those sort of situations into something else, and that's fine as long as as long as that avenue is available. And then in your subsection C, where you, one of these conditions, the village does not plan to construct adjacent sidewalks or multi-use pathways. Construct where? I mean, on this this subject lot that this discretion is going to be applied to adjacent um, to the subject lot is okay. the intent. You so, might. for instance, um, we don't typically do capital budgeting um, for sidewalks in and of themselves, but if it's part of a larger road reconstruction project, I, the most recent example being Oaks Road, where we reconstructed it, widened it over um, the, the river there, and then uh, added sidewalks adjacent to Case High School. If there was a property adjacent to that that were to develop, and we knew Oaks Road was budgeted for next year, we'd say, you still got to do sidewalks because we already have plans approved by the village board through the budgeting process to put in sidewalks here. So it'd be sidewalks or multi-use pathways adjacent to this subject lot? Correct. I, again, I don't know if you want to clarify that or not, but all right, that's all I had. Great. We'll clean up the language, but if everyone kind of agrees to the overall intent, and we've run this by legal uh, once, as we always do before we bring it to you guys, but we'll, we'll clean up the language in the final ordinance form and then uh, obviously run it by them again. Is everybody kind of okay with that just general idea? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Then finally, we have authorized administrative adjustments. Um, one of the things that uh, we'd like to make a little bit more explicit is uh, accommodating a disabled. Uh, persons uh, in the village. Um, so as of now, the only way to get um, something for like a disabled person would be to go in front of a variance if it directly conflicted with a zoning code provision. Um, this would allow some of those um, examples to apply for just an administrative adjustment, which is both cheaper and quicker um, with the idea that, you know, we don't want anyone to just be able to claim that you know I my kid is disabled, so I need X, Y, or Z condition, um, and then they sell the lot and move on, and congrats, they got a taller fence or something like that. But we did want to say in legitimate circumstances of which um, we have run across um, both here and in other communities uh, that these people should have some of easier relief than we would grant to a normal citizen. Um, ultimately, this, in effect, happens basically at a staff level anyways. Um, for instance, if someone needs an ADA ramp or something like that, we, we don't really deny them as it is, but we wanted to make it <laughs> explicit in the code instead of just us as staff being like decent people. <laughs> so, um, you know, we thought setting up a process made um, some amount of sense there. Um, for another reason that the variance process does not accommodate this is that um, by Wisconsin statutes a variance has to be about the property and not about the person and when you talk about disabilities it's hard to say that it's not about the person um, that meaning that you know it there's a line that says the owner did not create the hardship or is not responsible for the hardship well if you look at that really, really coldly, well, you know, if you got into a car accident and you're disabled or something like that, then you could rule that you caused that and, you know, big whoop. So, and I've noticed in other municipalities that I pay attention to that some of these variance hearings can actually turn very cruel. Um, and you don't want to do that. One in particular um, involved, um, you know, a, a a family asking for, to build a fence for their um, 
dot three year old daughter that had Down syndrome, so she didn't run out in the street. And um, they just had to go through the whole variance process in order to build, you know, a, a four foot high fence. And that's not that's not right. So, and this is a very limited kind of um, application. I mean, we really haven't had many of these before, but it's just good that to have in case those things show up. And then what happens when that person's not there anymore? Are you going to require that the fence be removed? So you can. So through this, you can actually put a sunset clause on, um, on these accommodations. So a ramp can be removed or whatever. Through the variance process, that runs with the land for all time. So that would basically stick with the land no matter who lived in it or not. If you, if you do something like this, then um, you can have you know, a, a, a sunset clause or something like that to say that it can be removed uh, when they leave. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need uh, the headlines of Mount Pleasant uh, against the ADA. <laughs> no, and you know this isn't meant to get around ADA requirements or you know really deal with too many ADA requirements. It's instead meant to be those circumstances where perhaps an ADA facility isn't required, but someone, for instance, a little girl with Down syndrome. I mean. A fence is not required per ADA standards in your front lawn, but we'd still like all to grant it anyways. It's just that kind of limited circumstance where, you know, when you're seeing an adjacent community um, deal with problems like that and we're reading about it, we can be, well, there might be a nicer way to do this where we don't have to put people through that. I think a good example that where we probably didn't follow uh, the strict state statutes is when I first started here about five and a half years ago, we approved a height variance for an outbuilding where someone had um, a disabled child and they wanted them to be able to play inside an outbuilding that had a little bit taller height to it as opposed to out in the street because they had um, mental challenges. And so ultimately the Zoning Board of Appeals granted that height variance if you're like following strict law, they probably shouldn't have, but the board decided to be nice that night and they, they granted it and we haven't heard a complaint since, but you know, it only takes one neighbor to come in and challenge that variance for it to devolve into like a very horrible meeting. So Yeah, but this is your language is off strikes me as awfully I mean, I understand the intent and I, generally it sounds great, but the language strikes me as a little somewhat loose and I don't know how this is going to work in the long run. For instance, it's not restricted to the owner. I mean, you talk about tenants. Tenants come and go. I mean, we're going to be granting variances relating to a tenant's disability and you're not going to know when that tenant leaves or doesn't leave. Tenants, as everybody on the commission knows, they come and go. We're not even, so we're not limited to owners and or owners, family or well, oh, I mean, we don't family. track the owner's family either, Tom. Like, I know, but owners tend not to come and go quickly as tenants. So I'm a little concerned these reliefs are going to be granted pretty liberally, yet tenants, again, you're going to have fences being put up, ramps being put up. I don't know what other accommodations may apply, but a lot of things could happen that are outside of the the rules that apply to everybody else, and, and they're just going to be there permanently because no one's going to... So I, that bothers me. And then the language, for instance, like this paragraph two, the relief shall be the minimum necessary to grant full enjoyment of the property. Tell me what full enjoyment of the property means. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a real that's, broad concept because full enjoyment of the property is unlimited. I mean, short of causing a public nuisance or creating a crime. I, I would say that that's basically like access the second floor to be able to get into the house to be able to you know park your your specialized vehicle or something like that something that basically uh, a, a regularly abled person would be able to do pretty easily but is is very difficult in this circumstance and as far as the ownership kind of thing this would actually kind of solve that because if we went through the variance process like in Sam's case that runs with the land forever and you know uh, 
a tenant can apply for a variance or apply through an owner through a variance just as well as anything else. So this could actually have, you know, sunset clauses to be like, take it down. If it's something that's like, unless like super gaudy or whatever, I haven't really seen very many um, cases where that's the case. And we haven't really, we've been here five years and we, we've only had one or two of these cases that even grazed this. So it's not something that happens very often, but when it does happen, you, you, you want to basically be allowed to be compassionate within the rules. Um, and if, if they don't meet all of these, then they still have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is authorized to grant it, but will have slightly different standards and not actually enforce the like hardship standards that, that I was talking about earlier. Well, I get, I understand the intent. Again, I, I don't want to be the Scrooge, but I am just think this language and the approach seems to be pretty open-ended because you are going to have, sooner or later, you're going to have somebody who wants to do something that they're going to view this as the, the right to, to get this variance. They're going to come in with the mindset that they're entitled to this. And if the language is loose and broad, then you know they're going to have be able to hang their head on something. And I guess I would make real clear that it's the community development director's complete and sole discretion. I, I would really make it real clear that it's discretionary, even if these conditions seem to be met in the eyes of the applicant. Boy, just make it real clear that the discretion director can still say no. Sam, you guys work with uh, our attorney on all, all this anyway. Yeah, we would, but I, I think that's a good uh, recommendation. We can make that more clear that it is truly staff's discretion to grant these. Um, there are some kind of administrative, in the administrative adjustment section, there is already a little bit of that language, but we can make sure that that's very clear. Um, and in the circumstance where I, um, or my designee through Robin or whatever staff at the time, got in a fight with a landowner o over that, like Robin said, we can always kick it up to the Zoning Board of Appeals, so. Oh, I wanted to clar clarify. Um, the way, where I initially got this idea is through, so Duncan Associates, who was the, co the consultant that helped us with our code and was actually fantastic. I'm almost positive they mentioned this during the update process, but it didn't actually make it into the ordinance, so much that I kind of bragged about it to other you know, planners and other municipalities that we had it. And then I checked and I said, oh, we don't. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I've seen um, uh, that uh, consultant basically recommend this exact thing, this exact format. Um, you know, it's called reasonable accommodation. Um, and it is something that has been recommended by them and also been recommended as far back as 2006 through um, uh, the League of Municipalities and uh, Zoning Handbook. It's, uh, it just basically has a chapter on accommodating people with disabilities and it has um, sort of sample clauses. I also reviewed sample clauses that have stuff like, that allow for things like this in West Dallas and Brookfield uh, and Barron County and some other places around Wisconsin. So uh, it's, not, it's not rare or super unique, but it's something I think that's pretty important when it does come up. Sam, when these things, when you guys grant the ordinate, uh, the variance, is there anything recorded to register these by any chance, saying that you're granting that so that public knows? Not generally, no. Um, they can require <coughs> that they are recorded um, at the time. Um, otherwise, it's internally tracked, similar to like the zoning map is and, but, but or a conditional use. I, I would suggest that at the time you grant the variance, there is a document recorded and that specifies subject to as long as the person lives there that's allowed that that not only that but i mean it, it gives you the right the, for one the seller can't sell it anymore unless he clears it if there's no tenant living there like that you know that's disabled and number two it it stops uh further problems with a buyer that buys it with the fence there and all of a sudden you guys go there well you know there's no disabled person here you got to take it down sure so I would strongly suggest that your legal department probably come up with a document. And I, I see documents like that for surveys. Yeah. When somebody builds uh, something on a property without getting a proper survey from the city, the city records a, you know. In, in the case I was describing, they did eventually approve the fence variance, <clears throat> but then required a sunset clause for them to sign basically 
um, uh, a deed restriction that basically stated that. Um, I think that's a little bit needlessly strict uh, sometimes because it just seems like it's like over the top. It's it's it, you're trying to to help them not be like okay, well you got to sign all of these sort of things. But I see what you're saying. No, it's just um, a, just a document of actually warns the potential buyer and then it kind of gives everybody the right that the seller is now aware that when he you know when that tenant is gone or whatever he needs to move that. Oh, okay, just like a note, like a warrant, like a notice. Okay. Here. It doesn't yeah. mean it's not it's not 45 pages. It's just one one page that specifies. Mm. Sounds good. We, yeah, I, I don't. It just answers whatever you're saying. I don't have an issue with that. We can uh, work through that balance with the village attorney. Just the one other practical consideration is to the, how is is the community development director going to be able to ask this applicant to in some way substantiate the disability and what the conditions are? I mean, it's it, I could see a, some applicants being very, you know. For their own personal reasons reticent to start explaining their disability to some stranger at the village hall sure. but without the knowledge of what their disability is and what their conditions are how does he then have it the statute tells him he needs to relate it to the person's disability <coughs> and then being the minimum necessary so you better have some way for the decision maker to get at least ask for and substantiate whatever information he needs. Yeah, and that would likely come in terms of an updated application procedure for administrative adjustments, of which the code gives us the authority to kind of write the stuff that people need to give us when they apply for these things. So, yeah, just the general narrative would cover that almost yeah. all the time. So, um, But yeah, I, I think there's enough coverage there that we could ask for that stuff right. without being obtrusive to someone's privacy. All right, we'll uh, work on it and uh, get back to you next month, um, hopefully with a clean ordinance copy. That's all we have. Uh, if you guys um, talk to anyone who has any other zoning code stuff or uh, have any ideas of yourself, um, just let us know and we'll start making a list for the fall. To, I don't know how many slides Sam put in here. Uh, one. Uh, one? What? Put five, okay. Uh, so on, I guess, last Tuesday, we had uh, a local officials meeting with WSDOT concerning the uh, re redo reconstruction of State Highway 31 between 11 and 20. Um, you guys re may remember it. Um, being brought in front of this board. Um, for those of you that weren't on the board at the time, um, I got approval from this board and then also subsequently the village board to write a letter to WSDOT requesting that bicycle accommodations in the shoulder on a state trunk highway designated trunk route, truck route of 35 miles per hour, six lanes is not acceptable. Um, and that we preferred a multi-use pathway off street. Um, they disagreed. Um, we kind of had some meetings and then uh, radio silence for a long time. Um, and they have sort of picked back up the ball and started to uh, give uh, sort of presentations on this. Um, and I, I suppose the, the summation would be, so I guess let me, let me try to quote it, okay. The submission was, remember all that stuff that we said that you needed? Safety improvements as far as more turn lanes, longer turn lanes, bigger median. Well, forget about all that. We're just going to basically give you the same thing that you already have. That is what the new design is. Um, with one exception that they're going to lengthen the left turn lane onto 16th Street. Um, they. I do believe that the project manager um, went to bat for us and heard us that we wanted something different. Um, I do not believe that WSDOT kind of gave us a fair shake when determining the additional costs that it would do, um, uh, given other sort of considerations. I think they were hamstrung by their own manual saying that they had to provide on-street accommodation and that a off street path would be in addition to and so the the end the 
end result was basically that if we wanted it, we would have to pay for it. Um, so going back up to the existing roadway section, um, a lot of the, the problems that you are, you are all familiar with State Trunk Highway 31, especially in, in this section. Um, there's three lanes, um, but there's often not a whole lot of designated turn lanes or turn movements. So you have sudden rapid stopping um, quite a lot so that you don't have very confidence that all three lanes are actually through lanes. Um, even WizDOT had a chart that said 46% of accidents along the stretch were rear end accidents, which tells you what? That there's sudden stops and then people don't pay attention to rear end each other. Um, when I brought that up at that, the sudden stops and saying that the turn movements and turn lanes should be at least maintained in the facility, um, they said that that wasn't why, uh, they were there or they proposed it or that, that that wasn't why the rear end crashes happened. Uh, to say that this meeting was disappointing, um, would be an understatement. I said as much. Um, and they knew they were kind of walking into it. Anytime when they go to bat and say, you need these safety improvements and list all this stuff. I mean, you guys remember how much stuff they put on there. And then they come back and go, never mind. You don't really need them. Everything is just fine as it is. And I told them, I told them, find me somebody that drives that road that says that road is fine. You won't find them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, especially because they that doesn't even have sidewalk right now, but um, there is, a lot of stuff that's wrong with that particular road. Um, WizDOT also main, would maintain that a, a, a bicycle accommodation in the, in the shoulder would be uh, fine, apparently. Um, at least the, the slightly wider lane is now on the inside of the road instead of the outside of the road. So I am supposing people on the outside lane, lane will now treat it as a 18 foot wide lane instead of a 19 foot wide lane or what, what have you. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else to sort of kind of go over of what this was about. So they, they get, kind of gave these overviews of what the designs are. Again, <clears throat> pretty much the existing uh, roadway, right of way. Um, and we're talking a potential construction date in I think 2025. So there's still a lot of time on this. They mostly blamed some sort of new budgeting accounting division that kind of gave them this cost benefit analysis thing that they had, okay, does this cost one? What's the safety benefit? If the safety benefit is greater than one, then, then it went into the project. If it was less, then it didn't go in the project. And apparently the off street lanes was way less and same thing with all the turn improvements and yada, yada, yada. So basically, they're just going to turn it into a gigantic repavement project. Well, OK. I don't know that that doesn't sound like it based on what I'm looking at here. And you can tell me if I'm wrong. Concept design, as, as you're showing us on this plat, is showing a five foot shoulder on each side, each direction. That's not there currently, correct? Correct. Okay, so why are you saying it's just a repaving project? I'm, I'm, I'm not following your... I mean, yes, they are putting uh, shoulders and whatnot, but the original design had double turn lanes, an increased median, um, right turn lanes, all sorts of extra motions and whatnot, and increased, especially along uh, with the intersection with 11, with the intersection with 16th, um, and, and so on and so forth. Just adding the shoulder, that doesn't, all that does is basically allow for a little bit of a pull off and that's it. I, I don't really think that that improves the traffic flow or, or safety. It might even increase driver speeds by giving them more visible room um, without any kind of thing to slow them down. Okay, but, and again, I basically they were originally gonna have a seven foot shoulder and they've done, they've rolled it to five and then they've added the five foot sidewalk which what we wanted what do we have any say or do we go back to them now because obviously it's moved back to probably construction of 2026 mm -hmm. why we can't go back and say why not eliminate the shoulder 
and add that to and make it a multi-use path instead. Yeah, I'd take it completely off out of off the roadway. Get the bikes onto a, a pathway with the with the pedestrians. The problem is, um, or we have the exact same line of thinking, Joe. Yeah. I mean, it, it almost seems too simple, right? You're like, yeah. well, 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 why why did they do this? Um, but the the shoulder increase or decreases crash rates by they throw out a figure as like 10 percent or something like that so the shoulder makes the right turn movements marginally more safe by allowing that smaller turn off area for cars so because it provides a vehicular benefit they will not get rid of the shoulder like it's there regardless and so they're saying if you want a pathway you have to then acquire more right of way and pay for the extra pathway width. It's not an either or thing. They're saying shoulders definitely going in and bicycles can also use it. We asked them how they plan to demark like yeah. the, the shoulder. They said they'd lay down a stripe of paint. And by the way, that safety benefit of the car going into the shoulder, do you, does anybody think that's a safety benefit for that bicyclist riding there? No, but that's what I'm saying is, <laughs> is that five foot enough to demand that it become a bike lane? And marked us marked accordingly. Uh, I mean, even if it were marked accordingly, our concern. A, no, they said they don't plan to paint it other than just like an outside boundary line at the essentially curb. It's like a five foot integrated curb um, and gutter, and uh, there's no other protection in place. And our basically our argument is boiled down to. It's not good enough just to say bikes have an area that they can use here when you're saying it's also a federally designated trucking route where cars are going at least 35 miles an hour, mm -hmm. uh, probably more because we've all driven on it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, suggested speed limit. Yeah. So, you know, we all know effectively what this is going to do unless you are the fearless Lance Armstrong one in 100 bicycle riders. Um, you are probably going to ride on the sidewalk, regardless of what age you are. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if someone, like, I don't know. I look at this and just think, if it were me, would I rather talk to a cop about trying not to get a ticket for riding my bike on the sidewalk, or would I chance my life riding in this gutter? <laughs> I would rather talk to a cop, because what cop is going to pull you over here and be like, you can't ride on the sidewalk? They're all going to be like, what normal person would ride in the street. That's actually what they suggested. I said, well, I like to design and think about bicycle facilities for a 13 year old kid, somebody that can't drive, but has some limited independence. And that independence is a bicycle. And they said, well, normally cops won't issue tickets to a 13 year old on a sidewalk. You can't tell that they're not 12. Yeah. I about threw something because it's just like, why would that be their official answer? Like, just don't enforce the laws. Like, it, it's very frustrating. And what, and what about the, the terrace section? Is that supposed to be for snow? Is that kind of what the terrace means? Yeah, yeah, it's for snow. The, I think the only time you see sidewalks right up against um, the edge is in like true urban areas um, sure. where you have a limited right of way width. Because I mean, we could even take the terrace and make it five foot, because you, and then add make the, the again the the sidewalk eight feet. Yeah, I, I that would accommodate more of a you know. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's a whole lot better if you're going to have bikes and people out there than five foot, because they're going to be there together. We know that. I've suggested all of these, and all of them have been shot down. One, and I'll tell you what our solution is. And okay. I've suggested all those, and all of them are shot down one at a time. I even suggested yeah. to basically really look at having two through lanes, and then if they can't, the reason why they can't do it for the cost reasons is because there's some historical area, and some of the rights of way is too expensive. Um, so they can't expand as much as they would want to. So what I suggested is that right now with three lanes, we don't really have three through lanes because people are stopping and going right. Um, so how about, you know, instead of saying three lanes, but we're not giving you any turn lanes, go to like two dedicated th through lanes, but still give us the turn movements for safer vehicle travel. Travel, but then and then you would be able to use the room as you were saying for other things. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't really fly either. So what I am suggesting for us to do and to think about and to mull over is, you know, basically put a put a statement out is that this is not acceptable. We don't like it. 
Um, and then, you know, we could issue a resolution. And then there's two things. We either put money it, into it or we use that to um, go up the chain and bother our state representatives, some of which I think kind of hold some power. Um, so that is um, kind of the options as far as it where it stands, because I don't think that you know, as a planner, I don't think that this design is what I would hope for, for, for re reconstruction of basically the densest commercial corridor uh, in the village. I also think that kind of redesigning it, making it prettier and stuff like that, the, the commercial area in here is not doing well. I think some somewhat of a facelift could help. Um, you know, that's just me. but. I, I think finally, uh, one of the no. things I, I wanted to emphasize was, you know, we're trying to take a 20, 30 year view of this corridor because it's not like the DOT is going to be back in this section for a while. You know, they're going to do this and it's going to be, you know, 20, 2045 the next time they're coming in here and talking to us about what does 31 look like. So not talking to any of us that are here now. <laughs> well, of course not. But, you know, I don't know what, like, robot engineer is going to be here in 25 years or whatever. But in the meantime, I mean, that we are going to be, you know, stuck with this. And this is a corridor that we have seen redevelopment proposals for. It's already fairly dense in terms of both commercial and adjacent residential. Mm -hmm. It has institutional uses that, you know, I'm sure the people at the church would like to have a, a slightly nicer right of way, or, you know, perhaps some of the kids could bike to that church instead of just being able to be dropped off. There's also the county multi-use pathway that crosses 31, and they had no designs for that yet. They said they would be forthcoming, but, you know, if we're not taking an entire cross-county trail that's being tied into a state network trail and providing better than gutter <laughs> bicycle facilities that directly connect into it, like, what are we doing? So If it were, they'd be going over like they do on Highway 57 and some of the other ones. Yeah, I mean, I could see the argument if you're looking at, like, 11 west of Sturdivant, where it is, like, that is a state trunk highway with a capital H. Um, you know, I would never expect someone with a bicycle to have the same accommodation on that roadway because it's just designed different, you know, as limited access and things like that. This is not the same stretch, but they're treating it like that stretch from an engineering perspective. So, you know, I think the things that Robin mentioned are, are valid. We'd look for your support in moving some of those things forward if we drafted them. Um, some of the other things we'll do is we'll keep you updated in the public involvement meetings, and hopefully that some of you would be able to show up and have our back, both as a resident and as a plan commissioner, because that does hold some weight as well. So Have some of the state legislators here during those meetings. We will certainly invite them or remind them that it's happening. And this is both us and uh, Racine, too. So there are some um, district boundaries where 31 is the district boundary. So this affects multiple different districts, multiple different political parties. Like, this is one of the things that everyone should be able to get in the big tent and agree that we can do better for our what citizens. What has been the city's position? Of, I mean, are they supporting you or are they just, they, at, they're just missing an action or behind behind like uh, interpersonal like sort of off the record conversations is they support what we're talking about on this call and in general we've asked them to publicly state and to publicly kind of come out and support a different thing and they haven't done it so i'm assuming it just got to the executive part of their government and it just stopped so we have asked for public support it has not shown up um I know it's there in the sort of the staffing level, but I, it just hasn't come through their legislative or executive bodies. But I mean, I know that their executive is very, very uh, gung ho about the county trail. So you would think that that would literally intersect with ideas like this. So who knows? If the sidewalk, it's five feet, if that was eight feet on each side of the road, you'd be much happier with this? I mean, the sidewalk, basically that five feet is going to be, whatever side, amount of sidewalk is there is, is where the bikes that are not, you know, a Tour de France rider is going to go. That's where they're gonna go. So however wide that is, is how much we get. Um, and, and I will stick to it. So something is better than nothing, but you know, 10 feet is our standard for a multi-use path. And we typically go to 12 in high traffic areas, so. I mean, even by saying, you know, 
Eight would be like a rural pathway, like an interconnecting bike path that's out in the country. Right. Um, typically, that's low traffic or mostly for distance riders. Ten would be your standard, and then twelve is you know like the busier sections of like the Oak Creek Trail up in Milwaukee County and things like that. So, and that's not to say there aren't even wider ones. I mean, some go up to a solid uh, eighteen feet, where you have six feet for like cross traffic and a six foot pedestrian only lane too so it really depends i think that's probably overkill for this area 10 would be a godsend well and uh, the other thing is um kind of a an aside i am in, in the process of asking sewer pack to model uh what the completion of oaks road north to south uh will do uh, for the traffic in this section, because uh, we've already sort of approved a plan to start the bottom of Oaks Road intersecting the 31 near the KR. If that were to go through all the way to Durand Avenue, that possibly could relieve some of the traffic on this section, because we all know people go to Oaks the 16 or Oaks down to Durand right now. So, however, when I mentioned that in the 31 meetings as a possible reason to maybe not have to go so wide, which ultimately they scaled down because they couldn't afford, um, they kind of, you know, tried to laugh me out of the room, which is like, eh, well, I mean, if you can't do it right, you know, what are you doing? So that is uh, what, where we're at on that. I think we'll probably talk about this a little bit more. I'd like to have conversations with uh, anybody that has thoughts about this as far as what you all support us doing to kind of get it out there that this design is not great. So, thanks. I mean, that's a happy note. On a happier note, George, dogs. Everybody likes doggos, right? You haven't been forgotten. Hey, Davis, can we take five? Yeah. Let's uh, take a three minute break.
a dog allowance for the beer garden that's happening actually beginning tomorrow this would have been lumped with their cabaret and temporary b license but i didn't get the formal request in writing uh, until after those agenda items were due so bringing it to you guys we've had this approved by the park and rec uh, advisory board in previous years there's never been any issues so we recommend um, the allowance uh, they're having a, in, a tandem uh, benefit for a dog shelter as well um, as part of this request. So it ties all together. But, yeah, I recommend approval for this. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, the only question I have is in regards to this is, is going forward, when we have these special events that allow dogs, Make sure the provisions are there because obviously dogs aren't allowed in our parks. And I think by doing this, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it because I, we've done it in the past and it's worked out well, I guess. But you're encouraging people, oh, they must allow dogs in our parks. So something that should be that this is a one, you know, making sure that they're letting the dog owners know that, hey, this isn't a dog cannot come in this park unless only for these events. I, don't know. I, I can make sure that that's established too but yeah we are looking at the dog allowances ordinances as well um from the village standpoint too because i mean to let our law is not allowed on the pathway either so and you know how frequent people are walking on that so the, we are reviewing all of that the pike river pathway is allowed i don't think by ordinance yeah well well okay let's we can we allow it because of the the signage and we've always allowed it it's, it's part of it's signed that way with leashes da 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 yeah I, I think dogs in parks in general uh, is something that we've had continuous back and forth on um, we'll get to uh, um, think about a more comprehensive policy um, in the future but for the time being uh, I think it is technically not allowed via ordinance but it's signed as if it is and also we can request that they're allowed for special events if i summarize that correctly. correct correct <laughs> that's exactly okay okay so so you guys are actually looking at possibly doing something with dogs in all of our parks yeah setting a more comprehensive thing but of course everyone has very strong feelings on all ends of the spectrum and there's also designated dog parks in the park and open space plan for 2050 so it all kind of works in concert together i don't think we have anything to present even any like preliminary ideas at this time but we are thinking about it internally i, I think probably having designated spaces makes sense to me well yeah, well, any, okay. any of this discussion would be brought as a future agenda item, too. So, yes. And before you do it, let's have a discussion about it, though. <laughs> oh, correct. That's what it would be. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So, are you looking for a, a motion here? Okay. Yeah. Anyone want to make a motion on this? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the special event application for uh, dogs at Simonski Park for the dates of. 623 through 625 of 2022. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Um, the next thing is I put together um, a formal adopt a park program for the village. Um, it's included in your packets. It includes the volunteer applications, waivers, the safety guidelines, what parks you could adopt. Um, this also includes the pathway as if a group wanted to get together to, to help with this. This is mainly for um, routine maintenance or just upkeep for the park that people want to have a, a bit of more ownership. Uh, they work in tandem with our department. Uh, it's very common for other municipalities to have programs like this. So. It's a formal program that we want to introduce. Um, just another initiative that we're trying to continue to bring forth to our community that others have. So, I'm going to answer any specific questions. This one doesn't have a, a motion. This is just a program that we, we would implement from the staff level. Do you just leave it up to the organizers to get the waivers and to kind of? So it would begin with the initial application. So they would submit an application on who it was. They would submit a formal roster, and then we would verify that with the app to make sure that they have waivers on file. 
there's a number of agencies that don't actually include waivers for their adopt the park program, but for us, we want to institute it. And then there's also for more uh, comprehensive or more elaborate plan, they can file like a special request uh, or a special task if they were looking to do something larger than what's part of our say our, for, that's part of our capital plan, but they want it because it's their neighborhood park or, or something that they feel would be something they would want, they could present to us, we could always bring it back to here, or if it's something minimal, we would then approve it from the staff level and, and we'll have them work in tandem with us on a, a little bit more comprehensive project. Are you working with any groups right now that do this on a small No, but scale? It, it comes, it, I've had conversations with some Eagle Scouts on, on some various projects. Um, I've talked with a, an Eagle Scout leader, uh, actually two weeks ago um gave him my contact info so just again a little bit more formal process instead of you know handshake agreements or you know verbal authorization for this this way we can actually recognize them too for for the hard work that they're doing um and you know we still have a, a relatively small staff for uh from a seasonal standpoint in, in the parks department so this would also help with some of that as well. George, you, you bring that up because the fact is in the past we have had Eagle Scouts do the signage over in Smolensky Park and there's some other areas and, and building a bridge or some a little things like that over in a wetland area. And that's something where you know you or the staff can handle that rather than having to come through the whole process here right. and doing it hand in too, just to speed it up. It's just a simple common sense uh, thing you am able to do that because uh, I know at our church we've had Eagle Scouts going out and build a, a lots of different walking paths around in our grounds and some other things in it and it works out great and, and it's you know we benefit from it we would benefit from it in the in the village and also the Eagle Scouts benefit yeah yeah so again any opportunity it could, could just be some neighbors who want to get together or it could be formal organizations that want to band together to to do that We'll provide minimal amount of supplies for them, which we already have, you know, garbage pickers, vests, garbage supplies, that, that type of thing. So, I think it looks very good and very comprehensive. Yeah, yeah, especially Great. especially for some of the, the little pocket parks we have around, which right. are nice. And you can see how many proposed parks were in the last most recent park and open space plan. So it's a way for us to get ahead of this as well. Right. Good idea. Good, absolutely. All right, then still me. So just an update on uh, the campus park project. Um, did we get, okay, good. So we've got some additional photos here um, in the, the slideshow that I'll go through, but I uh, just want to cover some of the things that have already been done out there um, as part of the about a month and a half of work that we've had. We've got all, obviously all the construction fencing. They've stripped and uh, stockpiled topsoil. They've cut existing sidewalks and paths. They've relocated an existing shelter out there. We've got a number of approvals that have had to take place for some of the structures like the basketball, the backstops, everything there. So we've been managing all of that. Um, they've excavated a lot of the courts and, and the walkways so you can kind of see it's actually taking a little bit of shape of that design that we proposed. And you can see in this particular photo that oval area where that great lawn would be. They have a cutout area of where the splash pad would be. Um, let me see, I just want to see which other ones you have. They might have a little bit better look here, um, a little bit higher view, so you can see where the playground is. Um, the areas that are cut out there is where the splash pad and, and shelter would go, and then the band shelves, bathroom area. Um, is at the top of that picture on the right hand side so um, they've just actually the construction company just recently our construction management company Featherstone just recently purchased their drone so they've got a whole lot more videos that have since been uploaded just in the last week um, and I'm going to transfer those to our project website that's on the village website so if you're curious of looking for it uh, and I, I'll hang around too if anybody at the end wants to take a look at any of the other projects. There was photos. a short time I thought we could just have mud races. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to your point there, John, it's the construction schedule had to be updated to accommodate some of that weather, but the anticipated completion date had not changed. So 
Um, so we are still currently on schedule. To, to I, I get updates a lot. Is I live over here at Fountain Hills now, and a lot of the people who walk around there like that, every single day they're watching it and coming back and saying, they're reporting what's happening over here and there and everything then too. So um, I don't have all the answers, but I know where to send them. Yeah, just find out your local pickleball player and they'll be able to fill you oh, in. Oh, yeah, mean, exactly. Yeah, and, and to that note, we are getting um, windscreens, which should be here in the next couple of weeks for the, for the players out there that will also help with some of the blowing dust that has been coming from the construction site out there. So they will be very happy once those are up. But... Um, yeah, and if people go through, we've got all the signage up to direct people to Smolensky if they want to use a different playground. Um, you can see with the amount of construction traffic there, it was impossible for us to keep that playground open. So, George, I have a question today. I noticed in the far <laughs> northeast corner, mm -hmm. there was a digger the, for the first time I saw over there. Is that going to be a pathway to Smolensky there, or is it where they, they where they where were they? That might be where the basketball this is way court. out of the normal construction area that I've been watching on a daily, you know, too. Um, they cut all the pathways that go around the entire park um, yeah. along along all the tree lines. So all of that has been that side has been cut out. They have laid out where the basketball courts are going to be, and they've done foundation work on the sh the shelters. Most of those footings have been been done. We have another concrete pour tomorrow, which I'm going to go to. Um, but I think that's for the band shell. But yeah, they've. Um, it could be the, it could be the cricket pad because that's a concrete pad that that's out there that they may have dug. I know that they were working on some some grading changes over there in that northeast portion. It was just far from where everything else was going on, and I curiosity, and I saw that you know you were going to be here today, so I thought we could find out. And you know, it's it's exciting to see. And, and a lot of people are talking about it, mm -hmm. not only the people who go over to the YMCA, but you know where I live and the people who walk on a daily basis and everything and then too. It's just that, uh, and, and how far are we behind in construction time frame and everything? Oh, we're still on time. They are on time. Yep. Okay. Yeah, they've just they've changed some things around, but the ending date for the construction schedule hasn't changed. Well, that's good. I, I will report that everything's on time and uh, you should be able to be there late fall. Yep. And I think that's it. Good deal. Thank you, George. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your patience for waiting. How are your new digs over there? Are you completely oh, moved it, in? Oh, it's and good. I, you know, I've got a uh, local card group is there on Tuesdays now, so I have some companionship um, <laughs> during the week now. Uh, no, it, it's working out very well. So Yeah, the senior group that used to meet here now is meeting over there and they were kind of wondering about it but <coughs> word back to some of us is, is that they're extremely happy because like we've got our own place yeah the, the, and, the ac has got to work out these last couple of weeks but yeah i know it's, it's been really good good hey, george i have a quick question in regards to that um pseudo parking lot on brown road and the bike path Mm -hmm. I see that you guys have put some silt fencing in there. Obviously, to probably stop from people from driving out of the mud and into the, onto the pathway. Are you guys going moving forward with putting some something down there to park on, like grinds or whatever? Or are we so a four, um, Tony has actually worked on that project. That will be a parking lot this year as part of the paving program. Okay, it is on the it's on the program. For yeah, the we year? have the, the I've seen the design plans for it. Um, uh, fully fully paved. Um, there'll be a little bit of landscaping involved, so we're following our own landscaping ordinances for parking lot screening, and uh, there'll be some bollards too to stop people from driving up on the pathway from the parking area. Perfect. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, we've got a, a pathway sign that's supposed to be going there, which we've held off on until that parking lot gets gets done. The sign's ready to go, but it's another one of those park and pathway maps. So. Oh, perfect. Good spot for one. Yeah, there'll be one there, and then again, we're still waiting on fully as much completion at KR before we put in the one that's down at that end too. So we still have two more that are going to be installed. Uh, we've had, so there's either four or five out right now. Yeah. Will we have any updates and have Brittany come in and talk about the rec program and all or neighborhood? You know? um, 
this time frame is very difficult because of the pro programs going on at this exact time. Uh, but I can get a report from her and, and tell you guys. I mean, about I mean it, it just might. You know, usually we do it wait till the end um, to report on it. But I can give a mid-season update at the next. I mean, if meeting. you can just give us an update, everything's going good and they're all mm -hmm. set and everything. And yeah, I think we've got close to two hundred kids because for she likes playgrounds. to come in and do a very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we've got at least two hundred kids in the. Um, in the playgrounds program, I forget how many total softball teams off the top of my head, okay. uh, but those seasons have been up and running. We implemented a uh, protocol for heat that uh, use, utilizing the heat index as the basis for whether or not we cancel or make modifications to the program. So, you know, we're we're continuing to cook out there. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. What do you have? It's me again. Uh, I just want to say this for uh, you know you guys in the audience about home, but I did uh, check out the the bike race uh, that's happening today, the Tour of America's Dairyland. It's uh, around the Fox, the Foxconn campus. It's a five mile course. I don't want to toot my own horn, but uh, I did pitch it, and it's happening. So I kind of like you know just emailed them and said, hey, try this horse, and that's what happened. Uh, and they, I am also. I've heard that they will be back next year and their their course will be around the village campus here with their main base of operations being in our new fantastic campus park. So we're really excited about that. The weather is great today and everybody seemed to have a good Better time. Better today than yesterday. Yeah, oh gosh, yes. Car like cars and, and like team vans and all that sort of stuff were parked on along Wisconsin Valley all the way from KR all the way to eleven. Um, and it's, it's been a pretty good atmosphere and like the riders really enjoy the course and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's a, it's a big win. Um, that was really cool. So just a quick question in regards to that though. I don't see any signage. I don't see any, you know, advertisement in the newspaper other that, that it was even happening, which is kind of odd to me that mm -hmm. we should have done more than more to that effect. And then where do you go to park right now? But if you, I, I have no idea. I know about where it's running, but where do I go to go view so this? At every one of the these sort of intersections around there, there is volunteers kind of instructing you where you can go park. They're like basically allowing the street parking because obviously there's lots of lanes that don't really need to be used all the time, um, and that you can some part some areas they're just parking like a little bit of parking in the grass like around the finish line and stuff. Um, but yeah, just kind of go over there. I mean, I biked over there because that would seem to be appropriate, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, the, it pretty much the, there is basically lanes open on the opposite side. The closed stuff is the interior circle, the okay. exterior circle, which is basically a counterclockwise circle is still open to vehicle traffic. Um, so you can basically use that to go around and, and you know, find a spot, you know, see how far it is and all that sort of stuff. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Or you could just post up on a particular point on the, the five mile race course. That's not the finish line as well. Um, but it's, it's still pretty neat to see. And there's a lot of, a lot of people out there. Um, and as far as advertising and stuff, I, I know Carrie's been kind of publishing and doing things for that. Um, and, uh, they will there will be news some newspaper coverage of it like i guess after the event but well like today they had it you know the coverages of the schedule races or whatever you want to call them down on the lake yeah. so probably in the next couple of days they may have something on the bikes in the paper yeah so it's been building it's actually the most um <laughs> the most uh, sort of social media outreach it got when it had was when they announced what the road closures were going to be and of course that got shared like 400 times so <laughs> you know and in that post a lot of people said hey this is kind of a good place to to do a bike race if you're going to do it and i was like eh, this is my idea so anyway, uh, really excited about that. So that's just something else. Uh, just going over our basic uh, applications, uh, Ministry of Adjustment application for 2215 Mead Street. It's the Habitat for Humanity. Um, they reduced the site yard setbacks from 6 to 5.1 feet. Um, sign permit applications, we have uh, 6325 Washington, the Hardy and Jansen. Uh, 13205 Globe Drive, Suite 207, uh, we buy cars. 
dot com. Uh, Washington Avenue uh, Scooters Coffee put their entire sign package in. Uh, I think it was no less than fourteen signs or something amount ridiculous like that. So actually, I had to say one of their signs is like, nope, you don't have any more room for this one. Um, uh, zoning compliant per permits, it still continues to be the season of the Badger Bounce Back program. So uh, I'm not sure, I wouldn't draw a direct, direct connection, but it seems the amount of uh, startup businesses located in one of our uh, office, mini office buildings that rent out by the room uh, is drastically up this year. Uh, most of them then ask for a certificate of occupancy to then submit an application for the Badger Bounce Back program, which is a $10,000 uh, small business grant uh, through the state of Wisconsin. So uh, those are all um, businesses that have gotten that zoning compliance permit. Uh, again, many on Bankers Road, uh, Dur Durand Avenue, stuff like that. Um, zoning request letters, uh, municipal complaints, uh, it is also the season of municipal complaints. <laughs> so this is all just kind of what's been happening within the past month or so. Um, and a lot of these have sort of received violations. Just that yesterday, I sent out the ones uh, for Greenleaf Boulevard, Sheridan Road, um, and uh, the, Wake yeah, the Wakefield Avenue one, as well as a couple other ones that aren't um, on here right now, but yep, pretty much normal. A lot of people just talking about weeds. A lot of the weeds complaints go to DPW, but it like, if it's like tall grass, but if it's noxious weeds that have caused blighted property that goes to zoning for some reason. Other than that, oh yeah. So we went, uh, we as in Sam, uh, your esteemed chair and I went to the APA Wisconsin conference. Um, not only did we go in Green Bay, we also did a presentation. Um, we did a sort of a one hour panel on our zoning code from 2020, basically uh, how we did it, how we got it passed, what it did, and what it means for everybody else. Um, you know, a lot of people throughout the state don't realize how forward thinking our zoning code is and how flexible it is and developer friendly. Um, and a lot of people are just, just like, well, how did you do this? How did you pull that off? And, it, and we kind of went through our arguments that worked for uh, people of different political stripes, people of different ideas of what they want the village to be. And it seemed that we got a consensus and got it passed. Uh, and just talked about other kind of uh, interesting things regarding to that. Uh, the conference itself was great. It was great to be back and, and commingling with uh, other planners and, and and uh, peers um, sharing some ideas on, on different things that we could be doing better. Um, you know, those will probably generate some brainstorm <laughs> updates within another three or four months or so. Uh, and that's always kind of the benefit for, for us for going to these uh, conferences is that we get ideas to bring them back and share with you guys. Um, also, you know, uh, sharing news and getting updates about potential developments that could be happening um, around the area and potentially in the village and all that sort of things that are coming forward. So really excited about it. And uh, oh, I did post this online. Um, if any of y'all want to watch this panel, um, it's approximately one hour. Um, it's basically me and Sam and Davis narrating um, a, a PowerPoint presentation. So um, that is available. Uh, I've shared it on my LinkedIn and I'm, it's not on the website, but you can just ask for the link. And uh, so anybody have any questions on anything I presented? You mentioned scooters coming up. We'll also have welcome coming down, right? Yes, welcome is uh, in the process of coming down. I think they just got um, their landscape a plan approved through Sam, if I remember right. Um, so that's in the process of uh, reconfiguring their property as well. The, the, the construction crews are already working on scooters as, as it is, which is kind of cool because for a while there, I was not sure that that development was going to happen. Uh, it seemed a little bit shaky, but it's, uh, it's cool that it's coming in. Yeah. All right. 
And then uh, uh, okay. just a conference recap on, on my standpoint. Robin talked about the presentation we did, but I uh, just wanted to make a point to thank both the Plan Commission and Village Board again for budgeting us for us to go to these conferences. Not every municipality does, um, and not every municipality. Um, sends their chair, um, which is also nice to have Davis there. Um, there's a lot of people who come up and are surprised to see all three of us standing there and interacting with others. So it's a really good opportunity. Um, some of the standout sessions, I think, were on the legal end and getting uh, the League of Municipalities a little bit more involved with the state planning conference. Right now, all the planners work for municipalities, and then the League covers legal and you know some other areas, too. So. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to see more collaboration between those two agencies uh, and groups. And then, um, yeah, just to thank you for, for sending us um, and thank you for allowing us to chat with you about zoning code stuff every three months or so. I think it's all kind of related and not every community tries to continuously tinker or uh, approve their zoning code. Talk to a lot of people at the conference and outside of it that think zoning code, you adopt it once and it should be an evergreen static document and obviously that it doesn't work for a community like us that's changing uh, rapidly so thanks again well i was very proud of the caliber that these two guys bring i mean it's amazing when you see the other cities and some of the things they're dealing with and whatnot i'm i'm very pleased that i'm where i'm at so thank you guys no problem good job i have something about the league um proud of the fact is is that uh, the annual meeting will be in La Crosse in the fall and our administrator will become the president of the League of Municipalities at that time so a lot, I'm sure our whole board uh, and everything is going to be there and I don't know how many other people but just letting you have that information Very cool. nice. all right anything else for the good and welfare Move for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?